At a late summer meeting of the South Greenville Neighborhood Association, representatives of both Jersey City Medical Center and CarePoint Health answered questions from the community about their business models, with the awarding of the Jersey City EMS contract still up in the air. Robert Luckritz of Jersey City Medical Center and Peter Kelly of CarePoint started the meeting by explaining their value to the community, highlighting the differences between for-profit versus non-profit. We're your local not-for-profit institution. And while I understand that there's different business models out here and it's not, I'm not up here to attack any one institution or to attack facility, there are a number of different ways that people can do business. But what the medical center does is we're your true community-based organization. For those of you who probably remember, there was a day when the medical center was actually a city institution. It was up until 1988 when we were so financially distressing to the city that we spun off and took that responsibility on as a not-for-profit. But at that same time, we brought with us many of the same programs that other hospitals don't, don't, don't generally provide. We have a robust homeless clinic that we operate on our own. We go out to the community, we provide these services to the homeless, provide them with social services, direction on how they can get assistance. We have the largest behavioral health program in, in the area. These are the types of system of programs that we're out there and we're saying, these might not necessarily be profitable for our institution, but we believe that they're right for right things to do for the community. When we formed CarePoint Health, let me just give a little bit of history there. Um, because if you take a look at CarePoint Health, and CarePoint Health are three hospitals. It's Bayonne Medical Center, Hoboken University Medical Center, and Christ Hospital in Jersey City. And each of these hospitals, prior to being acquired, and we are your community-based for-profit hospital, and we make no apologies for that. And before these hospitals were acquired, each of them, each of them, was in bankruptcy court. And why were they in bankruptcy court? Because each of them were community-based urban hospitals, much as Jersey City Medical Center has been and is, much as Greenville Hospital was prior to a closing. Um, and these hospitals were also in danger of closing. And just envision for a moment Hudson County with those three hospitals shuttered. 95,000 emergency visits, where are they going to go? 26,000 admissions, where would they go? 14% of the population that our system serves are charity care. And I, I think that we need to check the numbers a little bit, Robert, because I'm not sure at this point in time, given the fact that the growth of charity care patients at CarePoint Health, and this is by recognition of the health commissioner, has been uh, on the rise uh, over the past two years since we formed the system because we are focused on we are focused on the charity care population for one reason the Affordable Care Act because when the Affordable Care Act any of the patients that currently are uninsured and many hospitals have struggled with it because it's been that reason those patients that these hospitals have closed will be insured and they will be insured under a Medicaid product. They followed up by answering questions about both the financial and practical issues of being out of network within their healthcare systems. Understand something, number one, only 6%, 6% of the patients that we care for in the care point system have commercial insurance for which we're out of network. Oh, I understand, let me, let me finish, I, I understand that, I, I, I know that, that's important because if you're one of the ones out of network, who cares about what you're in network, I agree with that. Understand something, that, that all admissions, virtually all admissions, any hospital today, medical admissions, come through an emergency room. Elective admissions, which are primarily surgical, those are admissions that you as a patient have a choice, you need a knee replacement, you need some other elective surgical procedure, and certainly if we don't have insurance cover, or we're not in network with your insurer, then I would strongly advise you not to come to, to Christ Hospital because there's an elected patient. You will be responsible, and your insurance company will tell you that, for that bill. As a medical admission, the majority of which we're talking about here, in the out-of-network situation in the state of New Jersey, insurance companies are required to pay the charges of the hospital if they do not have a contract. And the patient is only responsible to pay whatever his or her agreement is with your insurer for your deductible or your copay. Nothing more than that.
Now, but I just want to explain, just want to explain, okay? Again, depending on what your deductible and your copay is. If your deductible is is a percentage of the charges, if your deductible is fixed, but in, in the overwhelming majority of the cases, patients are paying no more. But, uh, as, uh, as Kelly said here, it, it, it's a very complicated issue. It's, a, it's challenging to explain um, healthcare finance and how that all works. So basically, and I think uh, uh, Kelly alluded to this, is um, for those of you that are in network with an organization, uh, or in network with your provider, you will pay whatever it is that your provider has negotiated with uh, the Jersey City Medical Center or Christ Hospital or whatever hospital it is. So for example, if it were Cigna or one of those organizations with us, we've met with their individuals and we have set rates for all of the different care that they might receive at the medical center or in our ambulances or, or however it might be. You then have an agreement with your carrier as to how that's going to get paid out. Um, you may have a copay, you may have some sort of other uh, payment plan, whatever it might be, and that is between you and your carrier. Uh, when it comes to being out of network with an organization, and as I said, we are currently out of network with Aetna. Um, I believe also Magnicare is the other organization we're out of network with. Um, when those, in, if you were to come with that insurance to us, um, just as Mr. Kelly said, uh, if it is an emergency, then much of that will be covered by your carrier. Um, but you do have a portion that you have to pay on your own. Uh, for many of you, I have out of network coverage for myself, through my employer, for medical center, and there is a percentage, and I believe that tends to be the trend these days for most out of network organizations that you have to pay, say, 20% or 30% or 10% of the coverage. So in that case, you really need to look at what the charge master is for an organization. And what that is, is that's the, 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 the going rate, or say, the, the sticker on your car. And just like, it, just like buying a car out there, we all know that you can get it at a lower rate, and that's kind of what your insurance company does for you. They pre-negotiate a lower rate, and that's how we end up with these contracts. If you don't have insurance that's in network, the sticker price is what you have to pay. So the question that I guess here is looking at what the sticker price is for us versus what the sticker price is for CarePoint facilities. Um, and we have historically been uh, a much lower rate, our charge master is much lower than the CarePoint facilities. Um, in fact, in some organizations go so far as to point out that um, the New York Times did an article that showed that CarePoint actually has the highest charge master in the country. Um, and so for us, you know, that's why we keep our charge lower because there is a portion that you would have to pay out of pocket if you were out of network but the portion would be much less than what you would have to pay at a care facility. Finally, with the EMS contract still not settled, both Luckritz and Kelly answered questions about the level of manpower and qualifications of their respective EMTs. In the RFP that the city put out, they mandated in the RFP minimum standards in terms of staffing of ambulances and staffing of the command center. And in both cases, um, we, have, we will meet or exceed those staffing requirements. And we have actually, uh, since the first RFP uh, was issued and we were preliminarily awarded that RFP, we have, we have added six new ambulances to our fleet. We have interviewed 115 uh, potential staff, both EMTs and other staff, because we want to make sure that we're prepared to ramp up so that we will fulfill and exceed the staffing requirements that the city has put forth, both for the ambulances as well as for the dispatch center. Yeah. Uh, so, from our perspective, and I do have a little bit of monetary advantage here that I, I work directly with these numbers, but um, we do what we do is on a quarterly basis. We, are, as I said, we're a very data-driven organization, and we believe that data is the key to being successful. Um, data is the key to being efficient. And data is the key to improving outcomes in healthcare. So on a quarterly basis, we actually take a look at our historical call demand, and we evaluate the average number of calls on any given day, and we ensure that we meet and exceed each one of those based on the time of day, day of week, and season. So basically what you will see is our ambulances, unlike uh, some other services or like a hospital, instead of everyone coming in at 7 a.m. and everyone leaves at 7 p.m., we add ambulances as the day goes by. So at peak here in Jersey City, we have upwards of 20 ambulances serving the community between noon and say 5 p.m. I would say would be our peak time. And then based on the hour of the day, we slowly wean them off in the evening hours. Um, so there's less ambulances on the overnight hours, there's, there's less, less of a demand for ambulance services. There's a, a wide variety of training that we require for all of our EMTs. Um, you know, we do, uh, it's kind of a very complicated question, but I'll do my best to answer that. Yeah. Um, 
We require all of our EMTs to be EMTs. We generally require one year of experience or have some sort of internal training through our own department. So we do offer exceptions for those people that we bring through our own EMT program. Um, all of our employees go through a two-week orientation program. They get training on um, all of our technology that I mentioned to you. They get training on weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, uh, response to large incidents. Um, they get trained in uh, global packaging, all of the typical things that you would expect any healthcare, and I'm sure many of these are very exactly the same as what uh, McCabe would offer. Um, we do, in addition, we offer uh, quarterly end services that we do for all of our staff. As I mentioned, we have a robust tuition reimbursement program. Um, we encourage all of our employees to go through, we get their education, we pay for all of their tuition. If they choose to go and seek out higher education, uh, they want to go to conferences and things like that, we pay for all of their entrance fees so that they can get the additional education there. And uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question. I think it's a broad, but I hope that's, uh, that's sufficient. Thank you. I'm going to give a simple answer and echo what Robert said because, again, there are very basic requirements in terms of certification as an EMT that, that, that is required by the state. And in the CAVES case, as in the medical center's place, all of that is fulfilled. We have a similar, I believe the orientation is two to three weeks, but it's very similar in terms of all EMTs uh, within the CAVE. And, and again, I think the important thing to keep in mind here is many of these EMTs uh, over the years have, have I won't say floated back and forth, but it worked for both our organizations. So I think that the standards and the requirements that we're looking at, and again, to, to echo a little bit of what Robert said, but similarly with the case, we're not a, it's not a nine to five or eight to eight operation. They're responsible for all 911 services in uh, Hoboken, uh, Bayonne, and by, back up in Hoboken. So similar to what Robert just pointed out, the staffing to make sure that there are the proper number of ambulances properly placed, strategically placed, within the city at the right time are there because it is a 24-7 situation.